the law of agency is an area of commercial law dealing with a set of contractual, quasi-contractual and non-contractual fiduciary relationships that involve a person, called the agent, that is authorized to act on behalf of another to create legal relations with a third party. Succinctly, it may be referred to as the equal relationship between a principal and an agent whereby the principal, expressly or implicitly, authorizes the agent to work under his or her control and on his or her behalf. The agent is, thus, required to negotiate on behalf of the principal or bring him or her and third parties into contractual relationship. This branch of law separates and regulates the relationships between agents and principals, known as the principal-agent relationship. Agents and the third parties with whom they deal on their principal's behalf. And, principals and the third parties when the agents deal. In 1986, the European Communities enacted Directive 86 EEC on self-employed commercial agents. In the UK, this was implemented into national law in the Commercial Agents Regulations 1993. In India, Section 182 of the Contract Act 1872 defines agent as a euro or a person employed to do any act for another or to represent another in dealings with third persons a euro. Concepts the reciprocal rights and liabilities between a principal and an agent reflect commercial and legal realities. A business owner often relies on an employee or another person to conduct a business. In the case of a corporation, since a corporation is a fictitious legal person, it can only act through human agents. The principal is bound by the contract entered into by the agent, so long as the agent performs within the scope of the agency. A third party may rely in good faith on the representation by a person who identifies himself as an agent for another. It is not always cost-effective to check whether someone who is represented as having the authority to act for another actually has such authority. If it is subsequently found that the alleged agent was acting without necessary authority, the agent will generally be held liable. Brief Statement of Legal Principles There are three broad classes of agent. Universal agents hold broad authority to act on behalf of the principal, for example they may hold a power of attorney or have a professional relationship, say, as lawyer and client. General agents hold a more limited authority to conduct a series of transactions over a continuous period of time. And, special agents are authorized to conduct either only a single transaction or a specified series of transactions over a limited period of time. Authority. An agent who acts within the scope of authority conferred by his or her principal binds the principal in the obligations he or she creates against third parties. There are essentially three kinds of authority recognized in the law, actual authority, apparent authority, and ratified authority. Actual authority. Actual authority can be of two kinds. Either the principal may have expressly conferred authority on the agent, or authority may be implied. Authority arises by consensual agreement, and whether it exists is a question of fact. An agent, as a general rule, is only entitled to indemnity from the principal if he or she has acted within the scope of her actual authority, and may be in breach of contract, and liable to a third party for breach of the implied warranty of authority. In tort, a claimant may not recover from the principal unless the agent is acting within the scope of employment. Express actual authority. Express actual authority means an agent has been expressly told he or she may act on behalf of a principal. Ireland v Livingston, 1872, LR5 HL 395, Implied Actual Authority, Implied Actual Authority, also called usual authority, is authority an agent has by virtue of being reasonably necessary to carry out his express authority. As such, it can be inferred by virtue of a position held by an agent. For example, partners have authority to bind the other partners in the firm, their liability being joint and several, and in a corporation, all executives and senior employees with decision-making authority by virtue of their position have authority to bind the corporation. Helly Hutchinson v. Brayhead Limited, 1968, 1QB 549, Apparent Authority Apparent authority exists where the principal's words or conduct would lead a reasonable person in the third party's position to believe that the agent was authorized to act, even if the principal and the purported agent had never discussed such a relationship. 
for example, where one person appoints a person to a position which carries with it agency-like powers, those who know of the appointment are entitled to assume that there is apparent authority to do the things ordinarily entrusted to one occupying such a position. If a principal creates the impression that an agent is authorized but there is no actual authority, third parties are protected so long as they have acted reasonably. This is sometimes termed agency by estoppel, or the doctrine of holding out, where the principal will be stopped from denying the grant of authority if third parties have changed their positions to their detriment in reliance on the representations made. Rama Corporation Limited v. Proved Tin and General Investments Limited, 1952. 2QB 147, Sledge J, ostensible or apparent authority, is merely a form of estoppel, indeed, it has been termed agency by estoppel and you cannot call an aid an estoppel unless you have three ingredients, a representation, reliance on the representation, and an alteration of your position resulting from such reliance. Freeman and Lockyer v. Buckhurst Park Properties Limited, 1964, 2QB 480, the Rafaela or Egyptian International Foreign Trade Company v. Soplex Wholesale Supplies Limited and P.S. Refsen and Company Limited, 1985, 2 Lloyds Rep. 36. Water v. Fenwick, in the case of Water v. Fenwick, Lord Coleridge C.J. on the Queen's bench concurred with an opinion by Wills J. that a third party could hold personally liable a principal who he did not know about when he sold cigars to an agent that was acting outside of its authority. Wills J. held that the principal is liable for all the acts of the agent which are within the authority usually confided to an agent of that character, notwithstanding limitations, as between the principal and the agent, put upon that authority. This decision is heavily criticized and doubted, though not entirely overruled in the UK. It is sometimes referred to as usual authority. It has been explained as a form of apparent authority, or inherent agency power. Authority by virtue of a position held to deter, fraud and other harms that may befall individuals dealing with agents, there is a concept of inherent agency power, which is power derived solely by virtue of the agency relation. For example, partners have apparent authority to bind the other partners in the firm, their liability being joint and several, and in a corporation, all executives and senior employees with decision-making authority by virtue of their declared position have apparent authority to bind the corporation. Even if the agent does act without authority, the principal may ratify the transaction and accept liability on the transactions as negotiated. This may be expressed or implied from the principal's behavior, for example if the agent has purported to act in a number of situations and the principal has knowingly acquiesced, the failure to notify all concerned of the agent's lack of authority is an implied ratification to those transactions and an implied grant of authority for future transactions of a similar nature. Liability, liability of agent to third party, if the agent has actual or apparent authority, the agent will not be liable for acts performed within the scope of such authority, so long as the relationship of the agency and the identity of the principal have been disclosed. When the agency is undisclosed or partially disclosed, however, both the agent and the principal are liable. Where the principal is not bound because the agent has no actual or apparent authority, the purported agent is liable to the third party for breach of the implied warranty of authority. Liability of agent to principal, if the agent has acted without actual authority, but the principal is nevertheless bound because the agent had apparent authority. The agent is liable to indemnify the principal for any resulting loss or damage. Liability of principal to agent, if the agent has acted within the scope of the actual authority given, the principal must indemnify the agent for payments made during the course of the relationship whether the expenditure was expressly authorized or merely necessary in promoting the principal's business. Duties, an agent owes the principal a number of duties. These include a duty to undertake the task or tasks specified by the terms of the agency. A duty to discharge his duties with care and due diligence. And, a duty to avoid conflict of interest between the interests of the principal and his own. An agent must not accept any new obligations that are inconsistent with the duties owed to the principal. An agent can represent the interests of more than one principal, conflicting or potentially conflicting, only after full disclosure and consent of the principal. An agent also must not engage in self-dealing, 
or otherwise unduly enrich himself from the agency. An agent must not usurp an opportunity from the principal by taking it for himself or passing it on to a third party. In return, the principal must make a full disclosure of all information relevant to the transactions that the agent is authorized to negotiate and pay the agent either a prearranged commission, or a reasonable fee established after the fact. Termination An agent's authority can be terminated at any time. If the trust between the agent and principal has broken down, it is not reasonable to allow the principal to remain at risk in any transactions that the agent might conclude during a period of notice. Thus, the internal agency relationship may be dissolved by agreement. Under sections 201 to 210 of the Indian Contract Act 1872, an agency may come to an end in a variety of ways, withdrawal by the agent a euro however, the principal cannot revoke an agency coupled with interest to the prejudice of such interest. An agency is coupled with interest when the agent himself has an interest in the subject matter of the agency, for example, where the goods are consigned by an upcountry constituent to a commission agent for sale, with poor to recoup himself from the sale proceeds, the advances made by him to the principal against the security of the goods. In such a case, the principal cannot revoke the agenda euro unregistered trademark s authority till the goods are actually sold, nor is the agency terminated by death or insanity. By the agent renouncing the business of agency. By discharge of the contractual agency obligations. Alternatively, agency may be terminated by operation of law, by the death of either party. By the insanity of either party. By the bankruptcy of either party. By frustration of the agency agreement. The principal also cannot revoke the agenda Euro unregistered trademark S authority after it has been partly exercised, so as to bind the principal, though he can always do so, before such authority has been so exercised. Further, under S. 205, if the agency is for a fixed period, the principal cannot terminate the agency before the time expired, except for sufficient cause. If he does, he is liable to compensate the agent for the loss caused to him thereby. The same rules apply where the agent renounces an agency for a fixed period. Notice in this connection that want of skill, continuous disobedience of lawful orders, and rude or insulting behavior has been held to be sufficient cause for dismissal of an agent. Further, reasonable notice has to be given by one party to the other. Otherwise, damage resulting from want of such notice, will have to be paid. Under S. 207, the revocation or renunciation of an agency may be made expressly or impliedly by conduct. The termination does not take effect as regards the agent, till it becomes known to him and as regards third party, till the termination is known to them. When an agenda euro unregistered trademark S authority is terminated. It operates as a termination of subagent also. Partnerships and companies. This has become a more difficult area as states are not consistent on the nature of a partnership. Some states opt for the partnership as no more than an aggregate of the natural persons who have joined the firm. Others treat the partnership as a business entity and, like a corporation, vest the partnership with a separate legal personality. Hence, for example, in English law, a partner is the agent of the other partners whereas, in Scots law where there is a separate personality, a partner is the agent of the partnership. This form of agency is inherent in the status of a partner and does not arise out of the contract of agency with a principal. The English Partnership Act 1890 provides that a partner who acts within the scope of his actual authority will bind the partnership when he does anything in the ordinary course of carrying on partnership business. Even if that implied authority has been revoked or limited, the partner will have apparent authority unless the third party knows that the authority has been compromised. Hence, if the partnership wishes to limit any partner's authority, it must give express notice of the limitation to the world. However, there would be little substantive difference if English law was amended, partners will bind the partnership rather than their fellow partners individually. For these purposes, the knowledge of the partner acting will be imputed to the other partners or the firm of a separate personality. The other partners or the firm of the principal and third parties are entitled to assume that the principal has been informed of all relevant information. 
This causes problems when one partner acts fraudulently or negligently and causes loss to clients of the firm. In most states, a distinction is drawn between knowledge of the firm's general business activities and the confidential affairs as they affect one client. Thus, there is no imputation if the partner is acting against the interests of the firm as a fraud. There is more likely to be liability in tort if the partnership benefited by receiving fee income for the work negligently performed, even if only as an aspect of the standard provisions of vicarious liability. Whether the injured party wishes to sue the partnership or the individual partners is usually a matter for the plaintiff since, in most jurisdictions, their liability is joint and several. Agency relationships Agency relationships are common in many professional areas. Employment Financial advice, contract negotiation and promotion such as for publishing, fashion model, music, movies, theatre, show business, and sport. An agent in commercial law is a person who is authorized to act on behalf of another to create a legal relationship with a third party. Agency relationship in a real estate transaction, real estate transactions refer to real estate brokerage, and mortgage brokerage. In real estate brokerage, the buyers or sellers are the principals themselves and the broker or his salesperson who represents each principal as his agent. See also, agent of record, agency in English law, corporate officer, employee, entertainment law, independent contractor, literary agent, ostensible authority, principale euro agent problem, sestuike, registered agent, hawala, notes. References L.S. Ely and R.J.A. Hooley, Commercial Law, Text, Cases and Materials, Required to Negotiate on Behalf of the Principal or Bring Him or Her and Third Parties into Contractual Relationship. This branch of law separates and regulates the relationships between, agents and principals, known as the principal-agent relationship. Agents and the third parties with whom they deal on their principal's behalf. And, principals and the third parties when the agents deal. In 1986, the European Communities enacted Directive 86 EEC on self-employed commercial agents. If it is subsequently found that the alleged agent was acting without necessary authority, the agent will generally be held liable. Brief Statement of Legal Principles There are three broad classes of agent. Universal agents hold broad authority to act on behalf of the principal, for example they may hold a power of attorney or have a professional relationship, say as lawyer and client. General agents hold a more limited authority to conduct a series of transactions over a continuous period of time. And business. In the case of a corporation, since a corporation is a fictitious legal person, it can only act through human agents. The principal is bound by the contract entered into by the agent, so long as the agent performs within the scope of the agency. A third party may rely in good faith on the representation by a person who identifies himself as an agent for another. It is not always cost-effective to check whether someone who is represented as having the authority to act for another actually has such authority. The law of agency is an area of commercial law dealing with a set of contractual, quasi-contractual and non-contractual fiduciary relationships that involve a person, called the agent, that is authorized to act on behalf of another to create legal relations with a third party. Succinctly, it may be referred to as the equal relationship between a principal and an agent whereby the principal, expressly or implicitly, authorizes the agent to work under his or her control and on his or her behalf. The agent is, thus, in the UK, this was implemented into national law in the Commercial Agents Regulations 1993. In India, Section 182 of the Contract Act 1872 defines agent as a euro or a person employed to do any act for another or to represent another in dealings with third persons a euro. Concepts The reciprocal rights and liabilities between a principal and an agent reflect commercial and legal realities. A business owner often relies on an employee or another person to conduct a 